welcome you here this afternoon. Thank you, thank you for the invitation to come. It's a privilege always to be involved just in a small way in the work of God. And you'll just give me a second, if you will, while I work out how this microphone works. Return with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you, Fraser. That's a great relief. The Gospel of Matthew, please, and chapter number 26. And we'll read from verse number 36. <clears throat> then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell upon his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them, and went away again, and prayed a th third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he that is at hand, he is at hand that doth betray me. We'll read too, please, in the Gospel of Luke. Luke's account of this same story in Luke 22. Luke chapter 22 and the verse number 39. And he came out and went as he was wont, or he came out and went as was his habit to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye, rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, the multitude and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. And that is all we will read today. And we trust that God will bless the reading of his word, as he has promised always to do. And so I understand, as Gordon has explained, that this is the first in a small series of meetings that we'll be talking about the death and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ, or as it has become known, the Easter story. And I've been asked here today to speak upon the subject of Gethsemane, about which we've just been reading. And before we get there, though, I want to set a bit of the background. I want to present to you the day of Christ's death as the focal point of all history. I want to focus, I want to present to you the death of Christ itself as the focal event of all history and Christ himself as the focal man of all history. And then... Once we have done that and we've seen that, we'll then come to this story and we'll see on the very brink, on the very cusp of this most important day in the world's history, with the most important man in, in human history, what is happening? What is he thinking? How is he acting? How is he praying? How is he speaking to God? And that's what we will do a bit later on. And we'll, just, we'll learn from there. We will learn four lessons for us there in the gospel. And finally, we will have a little point that I'm calling the, the great implication of Christ's prayer in Gethsemane. So we'll start off then with Calvary and Christ as the focal point of all history, 
I want to show this to you in two ways. First of all, in the Old Testament scriptures, and secondly, through Christ's ministry on earth and his own, through his own preaching and his own words. And so then, I want to turn way back to the very start, way back to the very beginning, the fall of mankind in Genesis 3, verses 15 through to 21. The context is very well known, I'm sure, among us all this afternoon. God has created a perfect world. This is a world that is completely free of sin and any of its effects. And in this perfect world, he places two innocent people, the man and woman, who we will know as Adam and Eve. And perhaps we then think, we look back and we see this idyllic picture. All is well. God has declared all of this very good. There is no sin. There is no pain and death and suffering. It is only perf perfection there. And yet, one enters. Satan comes into this garden, takes upon himself the form of a serpent, and he comes to the woman and he challenges God's word. God had given this garden to Adam and Eve. He had given the whole world to them. He had not given them difficult instructions or things difficult to keep. He had given them one simple command. And yet, that is the one command that Satan came and he challenged directly that word of God. And Eve there, the woman, is deceived. Adam is not deceived, but yet still he goes on to, and knowingly they both commit sin together. They break God's commandment. And immediately their eyes are open to sin. They become subject to sin. They become subject to death through this one act of rebellion. And God comes down from heaven and he judges them. He judges them individually. He then judges the serpent as a creature. And he then judges the serpent as it's pictured, as, as a picture of Satan. And he says something most remarkable to that serpent. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice there that, that verse speaks of a, a singular seed, a single person. The seed of the woman also. We often think about generations proceeding through the, the, the line of the male line, but not here. And why is that? Because I'm suggesting to you today that the ultimate, the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy, of this direct prophecy of God, can only cannot come through one born of a man and woman in combination. Not one made like us at all, but one made totally unlike us, outside natural generation. One born of a virgin, made of a woman, made under the law, as Paul tells the Galatians in his book there. And so at the very beginning of the Bible, we see a principle established, a principle of sin, but a principle of, the, of a great deliverer who is yet to come, and one who is unlike us, mankind bound by sin, and yet one is going to come who has the power and the authority to banish sin forever, one who will bruise the head of the tempter and have the ultimate victory. Paul gives us a bit more detail on this in the book of Romans in chapter 5. He presents to us there Adam, the first man, through whom sin and death was brought upon us, the whole human race, but us individually this afternoon, under the penalty of sin because of Adam's act of disobedience, but yet to Christ Jesus, the second man by whom life and grace can come to man. But note to this as well, victory is absolutely certain. That even in that very verse, he shall crush the head of the tempter. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. But yet there is still a cost. There is a great cost to him. His heel will be bruised. He had to suffer before any blessing could flow to us. The only answer to this great prophecy, I'm suggesting to you this afternoon, on the authority of scripture, the only answer to this great prophecy is Jesus Christ himself. The one who came outside natural generation completely outside of man's effort, and who willingly went to the cross to pay the penalty of sin. It's all pointing forwards. This is the tenor, that's what I tried to get across this afternoon, is the very tenor of scripture itself is all pointing forward to one particular person and to one particular day. And so we'll keep this, this theme just rolling on an extra little while. Genesis 3 we've talked about. What about Genesis, number, Genesis chapter 22 now? To keep this theme running. Genesis 22, the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Mount Moriah. Abraham has lived on earth for decades, relying on God's promise that he will be given a son. His very name means father of multitudes, and he's, he's sat there in the wilderness for decade after decade, and still no son. And despite all of that, despite all of that, he remains faithful throughout. He believes God. 
And finally, when the scripture says he is so old as to be as good as dead, then the son is born to him. All is well. Once again, we see this picture. Something has been promised for so long. And suddenly it all comes to a head. It's all happened. And maybe you think that's the end of the story. But no, not at all. God comes down just a few years later, perhaps maybe even only seven years later, after the birth of Isaac, God comes to Abraham. He says, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And so, in faith, Abraham sets off with his son. And he climbs the the appointed mountain, and he builds the altar, and he prepares to sacrifice his son there as God commanded him. And let's just maybe just stop there for a second in the story. What does this remind us of? A mountain, a father, a son, a sacrifice, a death that is about to take place. Surely, surely our mind goes from this mountain of Moriah and goes straight to the Mount of Calvary, where there we see the son, the only son of God, not now the only son of Abraham, but the only son of God, who in a full equality with God, is ascending a hill and carrying upon his back a cross of wood that will in very short time be used to put him to death. One that has been long promised, long promised from Genesis 3. And now perhaps we think maybe Abraham thought the same on Mount Moriah. Maybe is it all gone wrong? Has something terrible happened here? His circumstances just caught everybody up and we're, we're sort of running towards the edge of a cliff? No, not one bit. This is the great news of the gospel this afternoon, that Christ did not go to a cross in defeat but went to secure victory in weakness and in humiliation. He was there to crush the head of the serpent and give himself for us. And there's the great difference. We've seen Isaac as a picture of Christ, but there's the great difference with Genesis 22. For in Genesis 22, Abraham, at the very last second, we might say, was ordered by God to stay his hand and not to kill his son. And there at the side of the mountain in the the bushes, they found a substitute, which was the, the ram, there to to take Isaac's place there was a substitute was found for him but Christ at Calvary Christ had no substitute Christ was the substitute he died that you might not we sung that this morning in Gorgi thou life of my life blessed saviour thy death was the death that was mine the truth of substitution and why you might think why am I saying this to you now why what's what's the point of all of this and what I want to say is all of scripture is about Christ All of these types and pictures point forward to an ultimate fulfillment that is found in Christ and only in Christ, in him alone. Calvary was no accident, no coincidence, but planned by God before time even began or before the world was ever made. So we come to Gethsemane, we don't see see a situation running out of control. We see a situation that's been planned before time had even began. And just to wrap that thought up in Romans 8 and 32, Paul tells us he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for for us all. Abraham could deliver his son, but God would not deliver his own son. And so one last Old Testament reference for us this afternoon. I was thinking now of Leviticus chapter 16, the day of atonement. What you might know as in the Jewish calendar is now Yom Kippur. And to cut this very long story short, God has given instructions to the Jewish people as to how they should live, how they should serve him, how they should go at business with each other in family relationships, business relationships, society relationships. This is all encapsulated in God's law. And a major, major, major part of this was that they were to recognize their own sin. The, the law was a schoolmaster to teach them about sin. And they were to, they were called then to deal with their sin and that whole system was the sacrificing of animals and you could think burnt offerings and sin offerings and so on there's whole chapters of instructions to how that was to happen but yet i'm suggesting to you today that there's one there's one central day that happened once a year this day of atonement where the high priest goes in once per year into the very holiest portion of god's house and there he offers sacrifices for the nation of israel he does this by, by excuse me, <clears throat> he does this by getting two goats and he casts lots over them. One was to be for the Lord and the other one was to be the scapegoat. 
And the goat on whom the Lord's lot fell was slain. The priest killed it, and he brought its blood into the very presence of God and sprinkled that blood on the very mercy seat, the gold of the mercy seat. And then the scapegoat, the priest would take, and he would put, lay his hands upon the head of that goat, and he would confess the sins of the people, specifically upon the head of that goat. And then it would be ordered that it would be taken away by the hand of a strong man. It would be taken as far away as they could get into the wilderness to take away the sins of the people. So sin is dealt with because there's blood on the gold of the mercy seat, and the sins are removed. And at that time, for that year, at that point, God was satisfied. Blood had been shed for sin. The people's sins were carried away. But when we come to the New Testament, we see a different picture. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that these things, tells us a, a marvelous truth in truth that these things were only a shadow. They were only a picture. The Old Testament scriptures, the, the sacrifices of the Old Testament scriptures could never take away sin. They only reminded the people of their sin once per year. It is impossible, says the writer of the Hebrews, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But when Christ came, what did he say? He said to God the Father, he said, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire. I come to do your will. And through the sacrifice of himself, he superseded that entire animal offering system. No more daily, monthly, yearly sacrifices, but one sacrifice sufficient for all time. And he was able then to ascend to God and sit down his salvific or his work of salvation completely done. Calvary was no accident. No, it was the fulfillment of at least 4,000 years of Bible prophecy and Bible teaching. Christ was not a man caught up in circumstances, caught up in something beyond his control. No, he was the one who was in control. He was sent to be the sacrifice for the, people, the sins of his people. Through the sacrifice, God is totally satisfied that sin is paid for by the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ is ever before God in heaven. Never is it, is it out of date, but it is consistently and constantly fresh before the sight of God. He can bear sins away. He can bear your sins away. Anyone who believes upon him has their sins removed from them through the death of Christ upon the cross. Not just a far away to the wilderness, but as far as the east is from the west, the Bible tells us. An immeasurable distance. An immeasurable distance. And time would fail us to think of all of these things, that, more scripture that speaks to us of these things. Briefly, Isaiah 53 speaks of one who is despised and rejected, one who bears our griefs. Psalm 22, thousands of years before crucifixion was even devised, it speaks of one who was forsaken of God and had pierced hands and pierced feet. So therefore, I, see, I, I trust that we have seen, therefore, Christ as the central message of the Old Testament scriptures and his death as its central event. So now, just briefly, before we move on to Gethsemane itself, I want to show you, too, that Calvary was something that was always in prospect for the Lord Jesus. Perhaps you think I've overapplied scripture. Perhaps you think that the New Testament is misinterpreting the old, that they're, maybe they're going too far. Well, no. I want to show you from the very words of Christ himself that this is not the case. He really knew what he was here for. Yes, he came to seek and to save. He came to heal the multitudes, to feed the multitudes, to raise the dead, to give teaching beyond teaching that man could give. But yet he came principally for the cross. I want to quote to you just four scriptures here. Uh, three of them found in Matthew. Matthew 6, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Matthew 17, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to, be de about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. Matthew 20, he said to them, the Son of Man will be delivered. They will condemn him to death, to be mocked, and flogged, and crucified, and he will be raised the third day. And then in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 33, yet a little, speaking to the disciples, he's saying, yet a little while I am with you. Where I am going, you cannot come. So what I have tried to do there is to show that Christ is the central person in Scripture and time. His death 
on the cross is the central event of all scripture and time. And therefore, the day of his death is the central moment of all time. So now we want to look specifically at Gethsemane and see Christ on the very brink of that day, the cusp of that day, and from his actions, thoughts, and words, draw some simple lessons in the gospel. And just before we do that, I'm going to read the passage again in Luke, just to remind us all of what we read. So Luke 22 and verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, By sleep ye, rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The sufferings of Christ in Gethsemane. How does scripture describe these sufferings? Being in an agony, his sweat was as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground, sorrowful and very heavy, exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. How remarkable this is. How amazing, how beyond our comprehension are the sufferings of Christ in Gethsemane, the sufferings of a full and equal member of the Godhead. And he is in agonies of spirit. How sensitive we must be this evening, how holy ground this, this we are really on this evening as we look at Christ on the edge of, edge of Calvary. He is suffering there. And as we stand by in the garden, as it were, and see the scene unfold, I want us just to be asking the question, considering the question, why are these sufferings? Why, why these sufferings? What is the cause of these sufferings? The Lord Jesus had been on earth at this point for around 33 years, and never before has there recorded a scene like this in scripture, where we see, we have seen him slandered by men, and he has given no reaction. We have seen him in the wilderness, assailed by Satan himself for 40 days and 40 nights. And yet Jesus there in the wilderness was able to, with a calmness and a tranquility that we could never attain to, was able to just dismiss the attacks of the evil one through the use of scripture alone. In a few weeks, no doubt, well, actually next week, I believe, you'll, you'll hear about the trials of Lord Jesus, where these men come before, take, take Lord Jesus before the courts of men, of multiple different courts, and they accuse him of all sorts of terrible crimes without one single trace of truth. And he answered not a word. And then in the following weeks, you might hear someone speak about the sayings of Lord Jesus from the cross. And you'll see one who is nailed to a cross of wood, and yet he's blessing those who are crucifying him. He is forgiving the very men that are putting him to death with Again, with a calmness that we could never show in such, such, such situations. The only time we ever read of Christ in this kind of distress are here in Gethsemane. And then as a little glimpse of it again on the cross in the three hours of darkness. I, I suggest to you then that Gethsemane, the only thing that could bring Christ to this state is the prospect of God's judgment that was about to fall upon him. All scripture has pointed forward to this moment. And to this sacrifice. And yet, now on its very eve, the full weight of it in prospect comes before Christ, the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Not the slanders of men, not the attacks of the evil one, but the judgment of his God and Father. Only they can bring Christ Jesus to this state. He was about to become the sin bearer. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Hebrews tells us that through... Through, excuse me, through the things that he suffered, the son learned obedience to the things that he suffered. That is, he learned the very cost of what it would and what it did take to obey God, to be the sacrifice for sin, to pay the penalty of sin. So I suggest to you that's the reason in Gethsemane that the Lord Jesus is suffering. He's suffering because he and his holiness is looking forward to the time when he will be made sin for us. And the extent of his sufferings, these are real sufferings, yet we must be very clear, these sufferings in the garden are not what we rest upon for salvation. Only the death of Christ upon the cross 
is something that can save you and to save me. But yet still, we surely we spare a thought for him in prospect as he looks forward and sees what's going to come upon him and the anguish that that brings to him. And so we come to my, my four simple and quite quick um, lessons drawn from Gethsemane. The purity, first of all, the purity and love of Christ. Second, the awfulness of sin. Third, the completeness of Christ's work. And fourthly, the awful punishment that awaits the unrepentant sinner. Firstly, the purity and love of Christ. We already discussed this in part. What causes Christ anguish is that he is about to be punished for sin. Judged by God as if he were responsible for all the, the entire problem of sin. God was going to make him sin for us. We are surrounded by sin every day. We commit sins. We get immune to sins. We don't even notice sins that are happening around about us that we even commit, but not so Christ. He, as God incarnate, felt every single bit of sin. He is totally separate from sin. In heaven, the holiness of his very presence drove sin away. Sin could not come into even the very throne room of heaven where he resided with his father God. And yet he is walking around the streets of Israel surrounded by sin. And now he comes to this point where he is about to be made sin. And we see him suffer there. And can we look upon this, you'll not be moved by it all, surely not, to see the only pure man, the only unblemished man, the only holy, perfect man, tormented by the very thought of being made sin and bearing sin. And may God just soften our hearts this afternoon just to see, just to catch the, the pathos of the moment as we see Christ there in the garden. Because note, note too how this, how this whole scene, <clears throat> this scene ends. We haven't really read that. But his, in despite of his agonies and his anguish, he goes on. He is not turned aside. His holy soul is repulsed by sin, but still he voluntarily goes forward to the cross, to Calvary, for sinners like you and sinners like me. Never has there been one so pure, but never one who loved like this. He loved as Scripture tells us Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Do not look upon this love this afternoon and reject it, but see that it is all for you. See him there in Gethsemane in agonies of spirit and how that he was not turned aside, but he pressed on. He followed through for you, not looking to his own interests, but putting them completely to the side, giving them up so that you could be saved. Secondly, then, the awfulness of sin. This is no light thing, no easy matter for Christ to die for our sin. We cannot read surely of Christ sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, crying out to God and dismiss this as something that is unimportant, that something doesn't matter. No. It shows to you and it shows to me the awfulness of the penalty that he was about to pay, to pay the awfulness of my sin. The awfulness of your sin, the very prospect of going to the cross. He isn't even there yet. But yeah, the prospect of it brings Christ to a state that no man has ever experienced before or since. Sin is all against God. It is the antithesis of God's character. And its consequences are dreadful. Christ died that we might not have to bear the consequences of our sin. But at what cost? What tremendous cost? The cost of his whole self. The cost of his whole being. He was abandoned by God. He absorbed the punishments of, of eternity in three hours, all to bear away the sin by the sacrifice of himself. May we this afternoon just be humbled by that. Be humbled as we look upon Christ and see all that it cost him to open a way for your forgiveness. May we see our sin as he and indeed his father sees sin. Thirdly, the completeness of Christ's work. Can we look upon Christ in the garden, see him in agonies before God's judgment begins to fall, and think then that such judgments aren't enough? Is Christ suffering only partially? Is the price only somewhat paid? I trust we see this afternoon that very thought is ridiculous. It is preposterous. We see Christ's death upon the cross is all sufficient. The only basis of salvation the only means through which God can forgive sins. And I suggest to you that Christ's sufferings in Gethsemane show that. He is not there. He is not there suffering in this way because something would be half done. He is there suffering because the whole work of salvation would come upon him. Only that. 
can be the cause of this suffering. And fourthly, then, the dreadful punishment that awaits the unrepentant sinner. Sinner, this afternoon, I want you to look at Christ and see him, the perfect righteous one who has never committed a sin ever. He has existed for all eternity. Sin has never come upon, come upon him or come into his mind. He has no sin guilt whatsoever, and yet we see him in deep sorrow when he contemplates his punishment for sin. He is sorrowful unto death when he thinks of the judgment that is going to fall. And remember that without Christ, if you die without Christ and without his salvation, that very punishment will be yours to bear. Christ died to make provision, but it's only here on earth that you can avail yourself of that provision. And if you don't, the same type of punishment he endured upon the cross that that he was anticipating in the Garden of Gethsemane will fall upon you for a never-ending eternity. No respite, only judgment for sin. Would that you would do, therefore, as Christ did in the Garden and cry to God. He will hear you and he will deliver you, but only because Christ himself was not delivered. So if you're unsaved, are you dreading the judgment of God upon you? Well, I can tell you from this chapter that you should. You very much should, because Christ did. And that is yours to bear if you go to the grave without him. And finally, then, my, my last point is this. The great implication of Christ's prayer. <clears throat> oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. I'm going to paraphrase that for you. If there's any other way, let's do that instead. If I can redeem my people by any other means... I will. But if not, I go on to the cross. And what was the outcome? How does this story resolve? Well, he goes on to the cross. There's no change of plan. There's no change of course. There's no voice from God from heaven announcing a change of plans. No other way. But silence from heaven confirming the way that was already set. It's been set from Genesis 3. The very beginning of time, the way has been set. And Christ did not turn back from it. And in the next few chapters, we see the obedient son of God be nailed to the cross of Calvary to deliver his people. What is the lesson that we draw from this? <clears throat> there is no other way. Salvation could not be delivered. It could only be delivered, sorry, through Christ's death. And so I implore you this afternoon to abandon all other thoughts, all other thoughts of self-improvement, self-effort, uh, rule-keeping, law-keeping, it is all completely and utterly powerless. Look to the cross and see there the very end of man's effort. Man's effort ended at the cross. There is no way for man's effort to compete with the perfect sacrifice of a holy and righteous son of God. And so I implore you then to throw yourself upon the tender mercies of God, who is able and willing to shower them upon you through the death of his son. Salvation is available. It is available. And yet, it is something that you have to attain, something you have to not attain, something you have to grasp hold of by faith. Salvation is available. And you can go to God and claim his salvation, as Scripture says, without money and without price. And so just to sum up this afternoon, remember Christ and his death as the focal point of history and see him suffering in Gethsemane and remember him there Remember his purity, the awful cost it was, was to him, but yet the love that he had for you to press on regardless. Remember the awfulness of sin, that one so holy would be brought so low to bear it away. Remember the completeness of his work. There's nothing more to be added, nothing more to be done. Remember that the punishment that he endured was something that will fall upon the sinner that does not repent in time. And remember, finally, there is no other way. Salvation is of the Lord and of the Lord alone. We trust that so God will bless his reading, uh, the preaching of his word, and we'll close with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank thee for the message of the gospel. We thank thee for a message of love and provision from thy very hand to the world through the death of thy son. Help us to look upon that scene at Gethsemane and to be touched by it to remember his holiness, 
We remember that he was separated from sin for all eternity, and it was never in his presence at all, and yet he was about to be made sin for us. Pray that would help us to appreciate that more and more each day. We thank thee for the all-sufficiency of his sacrifice. We thank thee that salvation is only found in him. We thank thee that it is not found in our effort. The things that we can do, we thank thee that we can cast ourselves upon thee for salvation. We pray for any unsaved who will hear this message this afternoon or later on. We pray that they would be blessed by sitting under the sound of thy word, that thy spirit might be operating in them and bringing them to thyself for salvation. We thank thee for this time together in thy presence. In the name of thy Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.